Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast, a member of the Edify Podcast Network. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you checked out last week's episode with Mark Roser about his book, Blindsided. He tells a story of tragedy and loss and how he has hope because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. The best way to support what I am doing is to go buy my new book, Eyes on Jesus, a 90-day discernment devotional. If you've already bought it, would you please leave me an Amazon review? I am in desperate need for more reviews. And if you haven't bought it yet, get one for yourself and for someone else coming up into this holiday season. I have an exciting partnership to tell you about with an app called Faithful. They have a great social media platform specifically for Christian content creators. It's also a way where we can specifically give you exclusive content without having to cipher through all the feeds that happen on other platforms. So download the Faithful app. If I'm not on there yet, I should be on there very soon. So excited for my conversation today with Sean McDowell. And without any further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. This show is about you and your walk with Jesus as we grow in discernment together so that we can make better daily decisions that honor God in all we do. We will align all things against the Bible and give you practical steps to run your Christian race to win. And now your host, the discerning dad, Tim Ferrara. Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. I am excited today to talk to my friend, Dr. Sean McDowell. Sean has a passion for equipping the church and in particular young people to make a case for the Christian faith. Sean is an associate professor in the Christian Apologetics Program at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. Sean is the co-host for the Think Biblically podcast and he has written, co-written and edited more than 20 books In April 2000, Sean married his high school sweetheart, Stephanie, and they have three children and live in California. Sean, welcome to the show. How are you? Tim, I'm doing well. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, me too. You know, we've emailed and talked to each other on TikTok a little bit over the past year, but it's good to talk to you in person and uh, just love your content, you know, your podcast, your books, the things you put on TikTok are so good, you know, whether it's just biblical stuff or you shooting hoops with your son or wearing the same Spider-Man shirt I have, you know, exactly. it's, cool. It's, it's cool stuff. It's engaging. So I, I would encourage everyone to check that out, but you're doing a lot. Uh, that was an awesome bio and it seems like you're very busy. Mm-hmm. So how do you have discernment with your time and doing all that stuff? You know what? It starts with priorities in terms of what I want to do. And obviously one priority is the Lord. Mm-hmm. One priority is my family. And then another priority is just doing ministry and trying to do it well. Yeah. So I look at my time for a certain day and I'll typically lay out, hey, here's what I need to do. And I just stick with it and I go to it without being too rigid. You know, that can happen at times. But yeah. one is just priorities. The second thing is I love what I do. It's fun. I enjoy making videos on TikTok. I love writing. I uh, enjoy doing the podcast and have just found ways to be efficient doing it. Like we'll go record six, seven podcasts in a day, just knock them <laughs> out. And then we got about six weeks of content. Yeah. So it's just a matter of loving what I'm doing, having priorities and and being disciplined while I do it. That's great. So talk to us a little bit about your journey to get where you are today, you know, growing up, influences you had in the faith and what kind of strengthens you to be the apologetic teacher you are today. Yeah, it probably would be impossible to talk about what I'm doing apart from my father. Mm-hmm. I know you obviously know who my my dad is. I'm, I'm sure some people watching or listening would as well, that my father, Josh McDowell, has been one of the probably most influential apologists in the past half century. Now yeah. he's been doing it for, for so long. And it, it never was growing up like, hey, son, you should follow my footsteps or you should write or speak. Mm-hmm. I don't remember that once. It was just use the gifts that God has given you uh, Mm -hmm. for the kingdom. And he modeled hard work. He modeled passion for me, modeled consistency of message, valuing family. And uh, for me, when I went through a period of questioning in in college, it was kind of mid 90s when people could first get email addresses and (laughs) couldn't search Google yet. But you could search these different blogs. And I came across a lot of this atheist web really began responding to my dad's content chapter by chapter. Mm. And it really unsettled me because I had never seen thoughtful responses to the case for the resurrection, reliability of the Bible. And it just threw me in a spin. I remember telling my dad, hey, you know, I think I, I love you, but I'm just not sure that I think this whole Christian thing is true. I don't know. He didn't freak out. 
Yeah. And he just, he goes, son, I think that's great. Seek after truth. And, you know, I'll love you along the way is kind of a quick version of this. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I stopped believing, but I think it was a moment of like, whoa, I got to figure out why and yeah. find answers to this. And uh, I think it was working through that that made me realize I want to work with young people and I, I need to be able to answer these questions for myself and for this generation. And then just started teaching and speaking and writing kind of took off from there. Yeah, that's really good. And, and that's a common thing in growing up in the church or growing up as a PK like I was is where you mm. kind of rode in and you, you believe in God, but you kind of ride on the coattails of your parents, you know, for a while sure. until it becomes your own faith. And that's such an important transition because they may not bring up all the, the questions that you'll hear now on social media and on YouTube and all these things. Mm. And you're like, wait, wait a minute, that it doesn't seem as simple as the childlike faith I had growing up. And then you have to start analyzing and saying, what do I really believe? What is truth? And then come to that realization, not because it's what your parents believe, but because it is actually truth. And it is something that you can grab a hold upon, whether they're in the picture or not. And there's a lot of, you know, PKs have an obviously a a reputation of either going extreme one way or extreme the other. And (laughs) it, it really comes down to, I think that that time in your life when you have that come to Jesus moment when you're like, okay, what do I really believe? And, you know, there's, there's classic ex- examples of people that turn away from the faith. There's a, the, a famous TikToker, uh, John Piper's son, Abraham Piper. Yeah. And uh, I've uh, duetted some of his videos where he's completely opposite other way. And it's not because he didn't have great influence. And, you know, we, we can't speculate on how much of a father John Piper was, but at the same time, it's not for not having truth. It's making it your own and having the faith to build the bridge between what we know and what God knows, which is going to be a gap of infinity. But at the same time, we can still strengthen ourselves with what we can know and then build right. that to, to have that faith. But so many people miss that part of, of just having faith to believe that what you, what you read is actually true. And faith is an important component in understanding truth because it's unquantifiable. And to someone uh, that may not understand it, it seems too simplistic. But the Bible says you have to have faith to be pleasing to God. And at the same time, it's not that we have blind faith, but it's faith based in something based in the word of God and who God says he is. Well, I, th- I think that's right. I mean, faith is not believing something without evidence. I think biblically, God reveals himself through creation, reveals himself in conscious. Jesus did miracles. Moses did miracles to give people a certain confidence and a sign so they could exercise faith, which is still a risk and a step of trust, but it's not blind. It's a step in light of the evidence, not in spite of it is how I put it. And that was a lot of my journey, just figuring out, okay, what do I really think is true? Am I going to live it out? Uh, if I didn't think it was true, my dad said to me, he goes, only give up your faith if you don't think it's true. Mm. So he was making truth supreme. Yeah. That's a message we often don't give to this generation, which is no truth and follow it no matter the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And a lot of people take the stance of pilot. What is truth in a sense that how can I know it? I'm just going to live my life. You say this is truth. Someone else says this is truth. It's just Mm -hmm. relative. And so that's why we have to be that much more firm, especially in this generation that questions everything. And it's not bad to question it, but it's, it's bad when you start abandoning the the principles that have withstood for generation after generation um, and throw them aside. So awesome. So speaking of discernment, which is the topic of this podcast, you know, a time when you had uh, to make a decision and follow truth where God was leading you, maybe down a path in your career or uh, and when your family, whatever you want to talk about, just a time you heard from God or a time you felt God was leading you in a certain direction and you, and you sought after him. Yeah. So I was thinking of a big, a big decision. One would be getting uh, my, dis- my PhD, which I started in 2010. And the process was I knew my heart was there. Like I was teaching high school at that time. And I thought, I just don't know that I can teach high school the rest of my career. So I was kind of yearning to do things beyond it, even though I still teach one class a week now because I love it on that level. So my heart was there. The big step was like talk with my wife. Okay, this is a huge sacrifice. Are we in this together? Why are we doing this? The other piece was getting our finances in line. What is this going to cost? Are we able to afford it? What would that mean for my speaking and mean for my traveling? And then I probably spent about, if I remember correctly, somewhere between four and six months Mm. looking at programs online, talking with people, emailing people. And just whittling down until finally found the right program. So 
for me, that was just a question of like a whole lot of patience, not rushing into something since it's a big decision, making sure I had the key components in place, mainly being my wife's support. (laughs) <laughs> and also not wanting to be what people say is just when you have your your uh, your classes but not your dissertation done. Mm. You know, some will say all oh, but dissertation. I didn't want to end up that, so I want to make sure I had the motivation going into it. And that really just taught me, like when you're making big decisions, if you can get a lot of counsel. Yeah. Uh, obviously, pray about it for wisdom. Take time because I've learned about myself. Sometimes I'll get really excited about something. And then two, three, four days, couple weeks, I'm like, you know what? I'm not as excited as I thought I was. So just giving something time is really big as well. And I'm going to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary with a distance program. And it was just a great fit. And I'm thankful I didn't go to a lot of other schools that I had considered, but yeah. only figured that out through time and talking with a lot of people. Yeah, that's really good. Especially on the big decisions. I've said this before, taking the urgency out of making a decision oftentimes Mm. leaves it where we can have a better awareness of what we're supposed to do. Because when something's urgent, you tend to jump at what seems the most, either the easiest or the most accessible, or, you know, I love how you had the, uh, the feedback of your spouse too, which is so important, you know, instead of just saying, honey, I'm doing this, but Hey, what do you think? Let's pray about this together. Are we in this together? Right. Because when when you go to something like a, a school like that, then you have to, I mean, there is just as much part of the process as you are because they have to commit and, and sacrifice exactly. like you do. And so that's that's great wisdom there. What was your dissertation on him? I'm curious. I did it on the deaths of the apostles. Did they oh. really die as martyrs? And uh, what does that mean for the resurrection argument? Love that. That's really cool. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. So uh, a big focus of the season is also what we do every day to keep our eyes on Jesus and just kind of practical steps that people can kind of listen to and maybe take pieces of to kind of make it, you know, relevant to them because no one can listen or or listen to what we have to say and say, I'm going to do exactly what you do. But at the same time, there's, there's wisdom in, in routine and kind of how we process things and keep our eyes on Jesus every day, because there is so much distraction out there. I mean, just, you know, I get lost on TikTok for unfortunately, sometimes longer than I'd like. And and then my eyes are not on Jesus. My eyes are on TikTok. And so finding balance is so important. How do you find balance? And and what do you do every day to keep your eyes on Jesus? You're you're great on TikTok, by the way, Tim. (laughs) I enjoy a duet at a time or two uh, with you and and you're creative and funny and have have good wisdom. So I know you put a lot of thought into that. I I do a couple of things. Number one, I have a podcast I listen to. It's called The Listener's Commentary. And it's a daily, somewhere between 15 and about 25 minutes of right now I'm working through Luke. And it's just a commentary, biblical teaching on the New Testament. It's solid. It's biblical, sometimes practical. I love it. It's called the listener's commentary to get scripture every day. Second thing I'm doing is I'm actually memorizing a verse a week right now. And I did a blog on it. I, I've been meaning to do a TikTok video, literally not even found the time, but have done uh, done it. I posted on Twitter, uh, posted on YouTube, kind of reminders there. And I came up with a verse a week, many rooted in the character of God, and have invited a ton of people to follow me. So Mm -hmm. your viewers, listeners are more than welcome, obviously, depending on, you know, when this posts, but just kind of do a verse a week. And this week is Exodus 34, six. First week was first John one, five. And so I try to take those moments to make sure that I don't just flip to my phone if I have a spare two minutes or five minutes and I'll stop and I'll think about the verse and I'll meditate on it and try to make sure that I have it memorized. So I just started Exodus 34, six. And if I, I don't quite have it memorized yet, but it's the Lord, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in uh, love and faithfulness. I believe Mm. that's what it is. So I will have it memorized by the end of the week. And I'm doing a verse of the week. So listen to scripture, memorize the scripture, two big things that I do, um, obviously praying and some of the other spiritual disciplines, but just carving out that time 
to not just rush into things and fill up every moment, I think is actually one of the biggest tools that Satan uses to distract us. Even if it's yeah. good stuff, yeah. it's just filling our time and doesn't allow us to really focus on what matters most. Exactly. That's so good. I remember when I was younger, I, I memorized scripture a lot more than I do now. And that's a good reminder mm. that it's so important because you get the word in, in you, not just reading it for knowledge yeah. sake, but actually getting it in you. You'll remember that stuff when you need it. And, and the spirit will quicken that to you when you're making decisions or when you're just living your life and you don't have time to read the Bible, but it comes to mind. And so having a discipline of, about memorizing the Bible or just journaling, because when you write scriptures down, uh, you tend to, you know, just like in school, you, you teach your students to write things down or to repeat things or to go over these practical things. It's the same thing we need to do with the scripture. Even if you've read the Bible a hundred times, there's still more you can learn from it. And there, right. there's such a difference between head knowledge and, and the practical knowledge of, of how you apply it and applicable wisdom is so important. And I was thinking too, of a video, which I haven't made yet, but just the importance of the fundamentals, you know, fundamentals of the mm. faith where, you know, if you're in sports, I mean, how many times do you have to practice layups or practice free throws or just <laughs> run? And you're like, I've done that before. I've done layups before. I know what, I know how to do that, but your coach is going to say, no, do it, do a hundred of them. And it's like, ah, oh, but why? And the same thing we we sometimes do as Christians, I feel is like, well, why do I have to read the Bible? Why do I have to pray? Why do I have to do all this? And those are fundamentals. You know, we want the deeper things of God, but you're not going to get there unless you have the fundamentals down and you do them repeatedly. I agree with that hundred percent. It's interesting when Steve Kerr first went to the Golden State Warriors, they had Clay Thompson and Steph Curry and Draymond Green, eventually uh, KD. One of the first things he did in practice was the fundamentals. He's like, mm. here's how you dribble. Here's how you pass. Here's yeah. how you box out. Like with the best of the best went back to fundamentals. So yeah. the moment we think we're too good for that, we are probably too prideful and we're just going to make some, some costly mistakes. So yeah. it's a great reminder. Yeah, for sure. Well, moving on, uh, you are an apologist, which means you're really good at making apologies. <laughs> oh, I had to, throw, had to throw a lame dad joke in there. So, but um, I was wondering when that was going to come. <laughs> So, uh, but to be serious here, why, why, why is it more important than ever to have discernment and what we believe and have an answer for the hope that lies within us? What, why is apologetics important? We talked about this before about having faith, blind faith and, and faith grounded in something, but, but what would you say for people that are, are not necessarily grounded in their faith or that don't necessarily want to go deeper in the things of understanding what they believe? What are some of the dangers when they don't do that, that, you know, might hit them with things that the world might throw at them? One of the biggest challenges that I face is convincing young people and parents that following first Peter three 15 is vital. Yeah. Where Peter talks about sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always be ready with an answer, but give it with gentleness and give it with respect. Yeah. Most people think, well, you're an apologist, you're a professor my pastor knows how to do that. Mm. But when their kid comes home and says, I'm having doubts, when they get evolution taught in schools, when they get to the university or they get online social media and they see some atheist video, a video by a Muslim or on TikTok. One yeah. of the things that motivated me to get on TikTok, I was like, wow, there's people of different faiths and no faiths preaching at our kids. Yeah. I want to be a voice here. Yeah. Then when they get rocked and their kids come with them questions, then they start watching my YouTube channel or emailing me or checking yeah. out the books, whatever it is. So the reason it matters is when we're not grounded, we oftentimes don't know how to process tough questions and answer them and can lead to a crisis of faith. Yeah. The other thing that happens is when we don't have good answers, we're not able to engage people well in their faith. So one of my favorite things to do there upstairs is I put on these fake atheist these glasses and role play an atheist and uh, I'll do it with Christian audiences. And uh, after I let it go 15, 20 minutes and I just give, you know, pretty smart atheist answers, audiences get defensive. They get angry. They push back. I've been called names. Wow. Then I take the glasses off and I'm like, Hey, how did you treat your atheist guest? Mm. There's always this look of like, Oh gosh, not that well. Yeah. And one of the points I make is if we don't know what we believe and why we get defensive and angry when somebody presses us. But when we have a reason why, we're not threatened by tougher questions. Well, this generation is facing more questions just one click away on their smartphones 
yeah. than any generation ever has in history. Yeah. So if we want them to hold on to their faith, and to live it out in thoughtful conversations with others and apply it to their life. One thing, not the only thing, is to teach them why we believe what we believe, which scripture says over and over again. Yeah, man, that's so good. And I don't know, we both grew up in the 90s. It's, it feels like it's just escalated really quickly, even from when growing up, you know, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with social media and the increase of, quote, knowledge where it's mm. harder to decipher the truth. And what would you say as far as some of the reasons that young people might come to you and have these doubts? Like what, what is the driving force with why they're questioning Christianity? Uh, is it just what they're hearing from like social media or is there like a common theme that you see? Well, there's a few reasons why kids will question scripture. Sometimes it can be intellectual. Some of the big questions that this generation wrestles with is the intersection of science and faith. Do I believe in evolution? Do I have to give up science to embrace a kind of faith? That's a consistent question. Another one is the exclusivity of Christ. Are you really telling me Jesus is the only way? Mm -hmm. There's a place called hell for those who don't believe. That just seems intolerant and exclusive of my friends who are Muslims or Buddhists or atheists, et cetera. The other big topic is just the LGBTQ conversation. This generation wants to be loving. They've been told to value diversity and inclusiveness. And a biblical view of marriage doesn't seem to match that larger cultural narrative. Yeah. So that raises questions for them. So intellectually, science and faith, exclusivity of Christ, LGBTQ conversation, and then some kind of problem of evil and suffering are typically the big questions that this generation has. But that's not the only reason why. I think a lot of them question their faith because of emotional hurt. Mm, Some have experienced a pain in the church, pain in their relationship with Christians. And so they're emotionally suffering. Many have seen hypocrisy. They've been treated a certain way that's not Christian from, again, a friend or a Christian or a parent or a pastor. And it just doesn't fit so they question it. Others have moral questions. They don't want to live out what scriptural teaching says. So yeah. whenever a young person doubts with me, the first thing I want to do is make sure that they realize, hey, I'm okay with this. And God is big enough for your doubts and we can work this through. So yeah. I want to give them relational security. But the second thing I want to do is get to the heart at what's really driving the doubt. Because no one's going to come up and say, you know, I'm doubting God because I want to sleep with my boyfriend. Mm. Or I'm doubting God because my pastor's a hypocrite. Like, they're not going to say it exactly like that. Yeah, They're going to raise intellectual questions. But if you listen carefully and do discernment, like the proverb says that a a man's purposes are deep and a person of wisdom draws it out, I want to know what the heart of that doubt really is. Yeah. And address it accordingly. That's really good. And it's so much deeper than just, giving a great response in a, in a social media comment, you know, uh, it, it, it's really about relationship when you try to get to the root of why people Amen. believe what they believe, like you're saying, you know, you, you can't just tell somebody we'll go to church without knowing that they've been hurt by the church and they need to have healing. Yes. And, and so, uh, you know, I think when we, when we talk to atheists or just maybe Christians that just kind of like are, you know, one foot in one foot out, I think we need to understand where they're coming from and have a deeper relationship with them instead of just quoting a Bible verse at them. It's like, well, I don't believe in the Bible. Why does that matter to me? Or when you tell someone you're living in sin is like, well, I don't believe in sin. I don't believe in God. So that really doesn't matter to me. You know, things that uh, we feel like maybe are reaching them might actually be hurting the relationship if we're not approaching it with love. And so, uh, you know, it's one thing to just say truth, but it's another thing to do it in a way that is, is both loving and helpful to the situation. And and like I said, you can't do that in (laughs) TikTok comments or social media comments. I mean, you can try, I mean, you can try and I've tried and and it's really hard. And there's people that are are genuinely seeking in the comments that I can tell. And there's people that are, I know I'm not going to reach who just want to be a troll. Mm -hmm. And it's just not going to be the time or place to reach them because they've kind of made up their mind in that, in that setting. One of the biggest topics with, with this generation is, is like you said, love relationships. And that's uh, your newest book is chasing love, sex, love, and relationships in a confused culture. 
Um, very timely book. And so the overarching point of this book is to ask the question, how do I seek God and his kingdom in my relationships with other people? And that might be, you know, your married life. It might be your single life. And there's a lot more specific topics you go about in the book, um, like LGBTQ and, and things like that. Mm. But just uh, for that foundation question of how do I seek God in my relationships? Uh, why is that so important? And, and what was your heart behind uh, writing this book? Well, I appreciate you asking that question because that does get to the heart of the book is so oftentimes in books on sexual purity, it's like, okay, you've got to be modest and here's, you should wear a one suit, not a two piece. Your skirt should be this long. Uh, you should go to these exact movies, yeah. listen to this music. Yeah, and obviously, dance. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Guidelines are helpful and important but it can so steer towards legalism. Yeah. I wanted to get to the heart of the question because if we ask the question first, what does it mean to love my neighbor? Mm. What does it mean to love God with my body and with my soul? Then that's going to inform the way I speak. It's going to inform the way I dress. It's going to inform the way I use my body. So sometimes we skip that question and we get to the details, so to speak. Yeah. If you're not unimportant again, but just need to be framed relationally. And that's how we avoid some of the mistakes that have been done in purity culture in the past, move away from legalism and get to the heart of the issue. So really what we do with our relationships and sexual purity, especially what young people do that is really a larger extension of what they do with their relationship with God. If you don't love God, you don't love other people you're not going to be sexually pure, no matter how hard you try. But if you start with that question of getting your relationship with the right with God first and with other people, the greatest commandment, then it's going to be a subset of my larger discipleship and identity with who I am. And frankly, that's a question we should be asking about work, about school, about every area of our lives. Yeah, that's really good. And I was just going to do a video recently too on this, this same topic of compliance versus conviction. You know, as Christians, oftentimes we're in a compliance mode where I'm going to church because it's the right thing to do. I'm praying because I'm supposed to. I'm not having sex before marriage because it's what my parents told me. And it's compliance following rules without relationship with Jesus. And when you have conviction, like you're saying, you're going to do it because your God's convicted you personally, not because someone's told you that because rules are made to be broken. And so if you're just following a cheat sheet of rules, you know, you're going to find a way around it. You're going to find a way to get to third base without going all the way. You're going to find all these things uh, to kind of, you know, bend the rules without really understanding the heart of the issue, which is holiness, which is doing it because you have a relationship with God. You don't want to displease him, but also, you know, that his ways are higher than Mm. our ways. And if he says something in the Bible, it's for our own good. It's not because he's a cosmic killjoy. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's one of the biggest principles my dad taught me. He he led one of the first really global sexual purity campaigns in the 80s called mm. Why Wait? This is long before True Love Waits by yeah. a decade. And he would always say, he'd say, God's commands are not negative, but they're positive. Mm. They're to protect us and they're to provide for us. Yeah. And that's kind of the heart of the book too, is really when it's all said and done, Young people are going to make decisions about sexual purity and relationships based on who they think God is. Do you think God is really good? Mm. Do you believe that God is actually holy? Do you believe his commands are an extension of his good character? Like it says in Psalms 100, like David says in Psalms 19, he rejoiced in the law of the Lord. He knew God's commands were for good. Now I had a hard time following him. That's a separate issue, but he knew they were for God's good. That's really what it boils down to for this generation. Who can they trust? Who are they going to listen to? And they're going to listen to scriptures if they think the scriptures are true and if they really believe that God is good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And just like David too, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a matter of perfection, but it's a matter of his heart, which came quickly to repentance when he did mess up. And that's, Mm. that's often where, you know, we feel like if we mess up once, then God's just pointing the finger at us, wanting to condemn us. But it's like, no, he just mm. he wants you to come back into relationship with him. He wants you to get it right the next time. So you don't make the same mistake twice. You know, it's that's why I I, I find discernment is so important because it's it's understanding why we believe what we believe and the actions we make, the decisions we make from a day to day, because so often it's and I don't want to say this 
as a general generalized statement, but oftentimes I find in the church, you know, it's about salvation, which is the most important decision we can make. But then after that, what do we do to disciple Christians to make decisions every day that honor God, you know, when they have to face criticism at work, when they have to face sharing their faith, or they have to say, you know, I I, I came to the altar, I, I believe in Jesus, but there's all these questions now. And how do we culture that and cultivate that, get them to the point where where they're practically living out their faith in in confidence and to be able to to address some of these questions that you bring up is to say that it's not it's not bad to ask questions and i feel like you know any church that that says don't question don't doubt mm. just believe you know is kind of doing a disservice when it's it's saying yeah no question that but let's let's talk about this together let's get to truth by your questions, because these are questions that people have had for, for centuries and generations. And um, we don't want to, especially to our young, our youth, you know, we don't, we don't want to say, don't ask these questions, but ask them and I will help you find the answer. And your book is, is, is so good for that. And what would you say for a, a good age, you know, to, to get this in the hands of, of youth? What would you say for uh, the Chasing Love book? Well, I had my daughter actually read it when she was 12. I was working through the manuscript. And I said, hey, if you read this and just go to your dad, you know, with your dad to coffee for an hour and talk about it, I'll buy you a pair of shoes. <laughs> and she's like, there's an outlet down the street. I can get two for the price of one. Is that OK? I was like, you can get three for the price of one if you can <laughs> find a good deal. So I would say probably, you know, 11, 12 is younger. But if you have that relationship with your kids, you can talk it through them. Why not? It's really written for high school and then even into kind of beginning college age. So there's not like cheesy stories where it's like this adult trying to speak in a high school language. I've even had a ton of adults read it and be like, wow, this actually really helps me understand the questions this generation is going through and how to talk with them about it. So the book is not written like I don't give simple answers and say do A, B, and C. At the end of each chapter, I have, I came up with the 30 toughest questions people are asking about relationships, sexuality, honest questions. And I answer them, but the book is meant to be read in relationship. Mm. I ask a lot of questions, point to scripture. I say, okay, if you want to love your neighbor, what is this really going to look like in your relationships? So it's more guiding people towards scripture, giving them principles with some practical steps, but really meant to be lived out in relationship with other students, with a youth pastor, with a parent, you know, a mentor, et cetera. That's really good. I love that instead of just like throwing a book at a kid and saying, read this, you know, and and actually following up and and going through it with them chapter by chapter. And Mm. um, that's, that's really good. So everyone check out that book. You have another book too. I want to talk about Um, a new kind of apologist uh, discusses insight on how to do apologetics in today's culture, uh, which we've talked about a little bit, but I was, I was curious about this specifically and having discernment with how we share our faith as Christians in loving others. And we talked about this a little bit, but what are some common ways you find Christians almost hurting the faith and how they share their faith in how they explain uh, apologetic issues and what is kind of a good balance in doing this? Have you found? Well, I found probably a lot of Christians hurt the faith through how they comment on social media. Yeah. I did a blog, I don't know, maybe four or five weeks ago, like how would Jesus comment? Mm. And I really thought about this and I was like, well, Jesus would actually ask a lot of questions. He wouldn't make dogmatic statements. Jesus would be very gracious how he interacted with people. Yeah. You know, you think about the way Jesus, there's times where he debated, look, began at John, where he made forceful arguments with the religious leaders, but he was compassionate, slow to anger, very kind, and reached out to people who were hurting. Well, I don't think most people comment the way Jesus did. We want to win an argument. We make a snarky comment. We're short with people. I actually find it's the exception to find a Christian who can comment in a way that says, I'm going to humanize this person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to listen to this person. I'm going to value this person because we don't really ask what's the end game of it. For most people, the end game is win an argument, sound smart silence this troll. Well, that's not the end game. To me, the end game is not really the person I'm even commenting to, but others who are watching. The end game is, oh, that was gracious. Oh, make that person think. Mm. Appeal to those, like you said earlier, who are actually open-minded. 
Yeah. So I don't think most Christians have given much thought to what it means to even comment Christianly. So what does it mean to turn the other cheek on social media? Well, yeah. one point that might mean is, you know, you don't have to win the argument. That's okay. Yeah, even if you're right. You know, sometimes go, hey, tell me how you came to that conclusion. I'd love to hear more why you believe this. Like just asking those questions shows care. It shows thoughtfulness. And that's why, by the way, First Peter 3.15 is like, be ready with an answer when people ask. We're right. not always patient. And sometimes <laughs> we want to force it when people aren't open. So I just like to see Christians comment with a smarter view of what we're trying to accomplish with more patience, with more graciousness, yeah. asking better questions with that end game in mind. Yeah, that's really good. And, you know, you might be thinking you're defending the faith, but you're actually hurting it and to actually have mm. discernment enough to say that I'm actually not going to comment. <laughs> it's actually okay yeah. not to comment sometimes to have the the strength to just not comment. I mean, I was bad about this like 10 years ago and time hop is an app which shows you what you posted 10 years ago. And, and uh, <laughs> sometimes things come up and I'm like, man, wow, I was young and immature back then. And it's like, you know, you, you learn and you grow over time. And through some of those bad experiences, you, you can grow it and see like from a higher perspective, like, man, I probably shouldn't have commented that. And we've all done things where, you know, you type an email, you say a comment and then you delete it before you send it. But sure. you know, it's, it's not a bad idea, especially if it's a heated thing to, to have another person look at it or just, you know, if it's not really someone, you know, or if it's just maybe a general post on a news site, uh, where someone else might see your comment, just scroll past, you know, <laughs> just, just keep exactly. moving, just keep moving exactly. because, um, you know, it's, it's so hard to, to, uh, understand tone online. It's so hard to understand mm. the heart of what you're saying in a, in a comment and kind of a separate issue too, just real quick is Christians <laughs> versus Christians online is, is, is brutal as well. And we, we tend to have less grace for each other. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you don't believe what I believe, if your doctrine is slightly different, if you don't believe about the end times, like I do, if you don't believe all these different things, you know, we're just going to eat each other alive. And that does such a horrible job for our witness to the outside looking in. So for example, you know, every, every Easter and Christmas, I always get comments like, oh, those are pagan religions. Why do you celebrate them? And right, it's like, right. first of all, who are you? Cause I have like, you know, a ton of Facebook friends. I don't necessarily know. And who are you? Why are you commenting? Do you even understand my heart about the issue? No, you're just commenting that. And that's just one example where that really irks me because it's like, come on, we're Christians here. If you don't want to do that, that's totally fine. But at the same time, for you to interject on my comments without even just send me a private message, if that's what you believe, you know, send me a private message. We can talk about it. But what would you say as far as Christian on Christian <laughs> social media um, but look, look, even that, even if someone really believes Christmas is a pagan holiday and they think it's important enough to talk to you about it, how could they comment in a way that would be productive yeah. and advance conversation and potentially change your mind? The people who comment that I've seen on that topic and a lot of others aren't thinking that they're just like, I need to correct him. He's wrong. And they jump in on some other conversation yeah. and cause more harm than good. Yeah. If they really were concerned about it, DM you privately, or if it relates broadly to something you're doing on Christmas, maybe just comment and go, hey, I can see your pastor and you celebrate Christmas. A lot of people are concerned about it, and so am I, that Christmas has pagan roots. How would you respond to that kind of charge? Mm -hmm. You're not going to delete that. You may or may not take the time, yeah. but that's a gracious, thoughtful one that actually would cause you to think about it yeah. and others might follow the conversation. Most people don't comment that way. They don't think about it. So yeah. ever, you know, the past year and a half, I've since COVID hit, I've been pouring myself in into my YouTube channel a lot and have gotten more comments regularly around <laughs> the world than ever before. Yeah. And there's plenty of positive comments, which is great. I appreciate those but it's actually more the Christians that respond to me yeah. that are just painful. Yeah. Like the way other Christians treat me. And they're like, don't you know you're wrong about this? Here's three reasons why I get better. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, what's, what's your purpose here? Do you think I appreciate receiving this email? Do you think it's actually helpful to me? 
Yeah. Now, when I see those comments, I know in 90% of the cases that person is hurting. They've been treated that way. They probably talk to themselves that way. So that it's coming from a place of brokenness. But it's the exception, Tim, for somebody to comment and say, hey, you did a show on the Enneagram. I view it a little differently. I right. wondered if you how you could respond to this question that somebody would raise. Yeah. That's thoughtful. Now, I can't respond to all of them just because of time and there's discernment in using my time. Yeah. But I sure try to respond to more gracious comments like that. But those are few and far between. Yeah. And and my motto with all this is the famous quote, you know, in, in essentials, unity and in, in non-essentials, liberty and in all things, charity. Amen. Because, you know, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes down to the, the primary tenets of the faith, we don't want to argue about them. Those are those are solid. Those are the, the tenets of orthodoxy for, for centuries. But when it comes down to secondary issues, there's grace to believe and have the convictions as you grow in your knowledge of God. Because, you know, I talked about this before with convictions. When someone has a conviction for something, let's just take an easy one like smoking, for example, right? I mean, let's say you're a smoker for 10 years as a Christian, and all of a sudden God convicts you to stop smoking. Well, now if you go and you tell everybody that they need to stop, well, it's like, well, where were, what would about the 10 years when you were smoking as a Christian and you didn't want to hear it from mm. anybody. And now you're going to go tell everybody to stop smoking. It doesn't work like that. It's like, you know, I, I use this example. It's like the person on, on uh, social media, that's, you know, meal prepping and working out and posting all these workout pictures. And you're just like sick of them. I don't want to look at you because I feel convicted about me not working out, you know, and it's the same thing. The people that have these, these convictions about whatever, you know, the end times, you have to believe what I believe. And if you don't, you're not a Christian is like, well, I'm not there yet. Maybe I'll get there. Maybe God will convict me down the road, but we have to be gracious as we're running the Christian race that we're all in different paths. We're all in different, you know, we're some are at the starting line, some are towards the end, some know more than others. And not to just say, Hey, why are you back there? But if you're back there, and I have a relationship with you and a seat at the table of your life, maybe I'll come and, you know, we'll do life together. Maybe we'll have a coffee together and I'll share my testimony of why I believe what I believe, which is much more different than just uh, condemning through a comment. So, well, I think that's really good wisdom, Tim, uh, to remember the grace and time that we've been through and extend it to others. That's a lot of that. It's the story of Matthew 18. Yeah. Yeah. Merciful servant. When we remember where we're at, how much we've been forgiven, we'll be gracious towards others. And I think maybe sometimes we forget that and don't extend the grace to others that's yes. been extended to us. Or on the flip side, we extend the hurt that we experience mm. on to other people yes. and end up doing more damage than good. Yes. Well, I can't believe our time is up already, but uh, this has been a great conversation. But Dr. Sean, if you could let everyone know where they can connect with you and find your resources. Sure. Probably the simplest place is just seanmcdowell.org. I've got links to my YouTube channel, links to my TikTok channel. Yeah. Uh, also do Instagram, Twitter, blog regularly. Uh, so if you're on any one of those individual ones, you could just find me there. But kind of the hub for it, for resources and everything would be my website, seanmcdowell.org. Awesome. I'll put that in the show notes. And uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on. This was a joy and a treat and I will see you on TikTok. You got it. Thanks for great questions. All right. Take care. Thank you, Sean, so much for coming on the podcast. Make sure you connect with what he is doing. He has some great resources and books for you. Also get my new devotional, Eyes on Jesus. If you would like more copies of this in a bulk deal for maybe your office, pastors at the church, your entire church, Email me at discerningdad at outlook.com and I can get you a deal on that. And for next week, I'm talking to Troy Mangum. He has a new book called Fatherhood Face Plants. I was also on his podcast called The Kindling Fire. So make sure you check that out. And he will be on this podcast next week. So until then, go with God, grow in discernment, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. For more information on Discerning Dad, go to discerning-dad.com. Be sure to follow on all the social media platforms. Just search for Discerning Dad. Please share this podcast with a friend and leave an honest review on whichever platform you listen. Feel free to send any comments, suggestions, questions, or prayer requests at discerningdad at outlook.com. Until next time. Keep fighting the good fight.